Good afternoon, everyone. This is Matt Kinsman from SIA's Connective Division. Thank you for joining us today. As I mentioned, an archive of this presentation will be sent to all registrants. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Carl Schonander, Senior Director of International Public Policy with SIIA. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you, uh, Matt, for that. So as, as you said, uh, my name is Carl Schonander. I'm the Senior Director for International Public Policy here at the Software and Information Industry Association. And I look forward to uh, talking to you all about the General Data Protection Regulation. Um, uh, so uh, quite a bit of interest in this topic, and uh, maybe that's not surprising given the fact that it's a big piece of legislation, and as you know, it enters into force uh, next year on May 25, uh, 2018. So uh, my goals for this presentation are to try to give you a sense for what the European Union is trying to achieve. That, that's important because I think it helps, you, it helps give you the context and gives you a sense for what's important, at least to the Europeans. And, you know, what data protection authorities and other authorities will be looking for. I'm going to provide some information and resources uh, for you all to take a look at. Um, I think that, um, you know, there's, a, there's information overload on this. The, the general data protection regulation itself is 260 pages long. Uh, I don't um, I do not uh, recommend that anybody try to read all 260 pages. Um, uh, however, uh, there are some shorter resources um, and guides that uh, I think might be helpful to people. And then I'd like to try to identify the key topics for software and digital media companies. Uh, just a, a brief um, history, the, the European Commission proposed the first version of a general data protection regulation um, as a revision to the 1995 directive. They proposed it uh, back in January 2012. And just one quick word here on the distinction between a directive and a regulation. A directive in European Union uh, uh, sort of vocabulary is law but it actually has to be transposed by the member states through their own law. And so that leaves uh, some degree of, of flexibility to the member states in terms of how they implement uh, those directives. A regulation is directly applicable law in the European Union. It does not have to be, to use their nomenclature, it does not have to be transposed into the member states. So back in 2015, in December, the European Council and Parliament reached agreement um, on, on the text together with the Commission. The final text was published on April 6, 2016. Um, and as I said, the legislation goes into effect on May 25, 2018. Um, by the way, as, as you know, all of you will uh, receive the slides. Um, there are links in the slides. Um, you'll see in this particular uh, slide that there is a link to the final text of the General Data Protection Regulation. That's useful. But I'm also going to add another link uh, produced, uh, produced by DSB MIT System, which organizes the information in a much more user-friendly way um, into different uh, chapters and, and separate hyperlinks. And I think that'll, and it also provides a table of contents, which I think is much more uh, useful to people. Um, and on that, um, actually, I'll go back to this slide. Um, in terms of table of contents, um, if you look at the text, there are general provisions in Chapter 1, principles in Chapter 2, rights of the data subject in Chapter 3, uh, obligations for controllers and processors in Chapter 4, and what you need to do in terms of transfers of personal data to third countries or international organizations. Those first uh, five chapters in total 50 articles, I think are the, the 
the, the key things to take a look at for uh, member companies first. I mean, everything's important, but, but those are the, uh, the, the, I think from the standpoint of member companies, the most important articles. So a uh, little bit on the key changes in the general data protection regulation um, compared to the directive. And uh, there, this slide links to a document produced by the European Commission which explains a little bit why uh, companies need to, need to care. First, there's uh, increased scope um, of the GDPR. Uh, what that means is that even if you don't have an office, even if you are not quote unquote established in the European Union, if you um, offer services to e EU citizens in the European Union and as part of that activity, um, collect data, uh, you are uh, subject to the uh, general data protection regulation. That's a, and you don't even have to be charging for those services. That's the provision that captures Google, for example. Um, and that's, that's a big change from um, what existed beforehand. Uh, there are higher penalties um, for not following the general data protection regulation. You can be fined up to 4% of global turnover. Um, if you're trying to convince uh, the CEO of your company as to why he or she should care about this, generally that's what people refer to. Um, uh, the, that particular number, 4%, I think comes from the um, penalties that the European Commission can levy in competition or antitrust cases. Um, not saying the European Union is going to do this as often in the case of the General Data Protection Regulation, but it is a possibility. Um, consent, um, you have to write, you, have, you really have to think about how you write your consent uh, documents. They, the, the Commission says repeatedly they need to be written clearly, so not in legalese. There's a breach notification requirement. Um, if there's a breach, um, there's a 72-hour breach notification requirement. You need to notify the data protection authority that is the one that you report to. Um, you also, in some cases, this is in Article 34, need to uh, notify the individual concerned. Um, and you have to do that, quote unquote, without undue delay. That's a little bit fuzzy in terms of what that means. Um, if there's an issue, I my recommendation is to consult the data protection authority that you report to and, and, and find out what they say. Um, there's a right of access in Article 15. Customers have a right to access their data. There's a right to be forgotten, uh, which is called the right to erasure by the European uh, Commission. Um, there's a data portability right for consumers, um, privacy by design, privacy expected to be built in for new processing operations. And, um, and this is important because the, the Commission in many ways is very formalistic. Um, if you're subject to the general data protection regulation, you need to have a data protection officer. Now that doesn't mean that you as a company need to create a new headcount for that, but um, you do have to have somebody who is sort of logical in your organization uh, designated to be the uh, data protection officer. So as I said, um, uh, the question of who the GDPR um, uh, applies to is, is very important. You need to look at um, Article 3 um, of the uh, General Data Protection Regulation. It applies to the processing of personal data and it applies to the processing of personal data of data subjects who are in the union. <clears throat> so important to know uh, what the definition of per personal data is. So if you go to um, Article 4, um, of the general data protection regulation. That's quite uh, important because that provides all the definitions. So 
Personal data in this context means any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person, otherwise known as a data subject. An identifiable natural person is one who can be identified directly or indirectly, in particular by reference to an identifier, such as a name, identification number, location data, or an online identifier. So take a look at that. Um, so again, um, even if you don't have an office in an EU country, if you offer services, even if not for payment, to EU citizens in the union, you are subject to the general data protection regulation. And you see the next bullet. Um, I did get a question from a member company. Well, what if I offer services to European Union citizens, but they're not actually physically located in the European Union? Am I subject to the general data protection regulation? In that case, you are not. So um, as I said, uh, date for entry into force is May 25, 2018. We are in October, so we have eight months to go, eight, nine months to go until entry into force how to prepare for this if you think you're, you are subject to the general data protection regulation. There are a couple of different resources that I recommend. Um, I very much like uh, two. Um, there is the British Information Commission on what to expect in the run-up to entry into force. It's worthwhile taking a look at what they say. Um, there's a toolkit for small and medium-sized enterprises. And there is a separate document on 12 steps to take now um, uh, for, for any company, to, irrespective of, of size. And I'm going to go through those steps um, shortly. Um, and for those of you who are uh, wondering um, the, uh, the, why is it relevant to talk about the British Information Commission, given the fact that the United Kingdom is planning to leave the European Union, um, actually, the, the, the British government um, and authorities have made it clear that they intend to um, abide by the general data protection regulation. So they will abide by it despite uh, Brexit. So, um, I mean, it's, it almost seems like there's a 12-step program here. But um, so the first step that um, the British Information Commission Office recommends is to make sure that management knows about the general data protection regulation, why it matters to the company, and what the company needs to do in order to, to comply. And it's not just a, a question of potential fines, although, of course, that's very important. But um, every, uh, every CEO is also concerned about the reputational risk that a, that a company has. So you, you want to make sure that you're, that you're doing the right thing. You should, at, to begin with, uh, know what kind of data you hold. Um, is it personal data? Um, is it um, data held by EU citizens? What kind of personal data um, do you hold? How have you obtained that, that data? Is it through um, consent or through some other kind of uh, lawful processing uh, rationale? So you really do have to do a little bit of homework in terms of determining uh, what kind of uh, data, personal data, you hold. Um, you should take a look at what kind of uh, privacy notices you have. Um, uh, you know, if they're written in, in a way that is incomprehensible even to yourselves, uh, meaning by, by, by that I mean incomprehensible to a non-lawyer, then you probably need to um, consider redrafting those privacy notices. Because what the, what the authorities in Europe are going to be a look, on the lookout for is um, incomprehensible, uh, legalistic uh, language. So make sure you understand uh, what um, the data subject's rights are poor, per the general data protection 
regulation. Um, here are some uh, listed, uh, the right of access, the right to rectification, right to erasure, or right to be forgotten. That, that's one that's gotten uh, a huge amount of publicity. Um, right to restriction of processing, right to data portability, right to object to automated processing. So data portability has gotten quite a bit of attention as well. We've done some work on, on that topic. Um, uh, um, data subjects, you know, if they provided data through a consent process to a company, have a right to get that data in a machine-readable format um, and then maybe use another processor uh, with that data. So that's something to uh, take a look at. Another thing that the um, Commission has spent a lot of time, Commission and the Data Protection Authorities have spent a lot of time thinking about is what they call over in Europe automated processing. In other words, um, under what circumstances can you engage in processing of data to uh, make a decision that has what the Europeans call sort of a legally binding effect on them. And, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the example that everybody um, mentions is credit scoring. Um, you know, under, uh, you know, what circumstances can you engage in this? You, you, if, if any of you engage in something like this, you need to be very careful under, under what basis you're actually doing this. Um, there is um, the European Article 29 Working Party, which is the entity that groups together all data protection authorities in the European Union, has actually issued guidance on what companies can do with respect to automated processing in, an, in the employer-employee context. And the bottom line for there is um, they're they don't look very favorably upon automated processing in the employer-employee context. So if you do any of that, you should look at that pretty carefully. Um, so update your procedures um, to make sure that you can comply with um, uh, individuals' rights under the General Data Protection Regulation. Review your data processing activities and document the legal basis for the kind of data processing activity that you, that you engage in, which will normally be consent. Again, on consent, review how your organization seeks, obtains, and records consent and consider whether any changes are needed. Children, children are always sensitive, um, so if you engage in any data processing um, uh, regarding children, uh, make sure um, that you um, have the procedures in place um, uh, to deal with that. Data breaches, um, I, I spoke about this a little bit because before this presentation, I received a question from a participant about that. Um, there is a 72-hour a uh, uh, data br uh, notification uh, requirement. So, um, so who are you supposed to notify to? So when the General Data Protection Regulation was unveiled, the European Commission uh, tried to sell this as a business-friendly uh, regulation in the sense that um, the regulation applies all over Europe. Companies don't have to um, apply, uh, apply you know, 27 or 28 different rules, and you're only subject to one data protection authority, not 27 different ones, the so-called one-stop shop. Um, a little bit of that got, uh, got lost in the sausage making, but in principle, um, even if you operate in all 27 countries, you should, as a, as a, you should, uh, as, a, as a sort of first uh, order, um, be responsible only to one data protection authority, and then that data protection authority takes responsibility for coordinating with the other ones in case they have to make a decision on uh, your data process processing activity. So my recommendation is, um, if you have a data breach, notify 
to the data protection authority that um, you think you respond to, and then ask them for advice as to what to do. Um, there are um, Article 34 in the, um, in the General Data Protection Regulation deals with obligations when a data breach happens towards data subjects. You are supposed to notify data subjects if the data breach um, is likely to, quote unquote, result in a high risk to the rights and freedoms of natural persons. Then you're supposed to communicate that personal data breach to the data subject, quote unquote, without undue delay. Not clear what that means exactly, but um, my recommendation, again, if something serious happens, is to consult with the data protection authority that you think um, is your primary regulator. So uh, sometimes you may want to engage in a data protection impact assessment when you're thinking of conducting a new form of data processing. That's really, uh, that's not something that I think you need to do all the time. Um, but if you're going to do something that is dealing with particularly sensitive data, then you might consider uh, doing that. And th there is guidance for, for how to do that. Uh, data protection officer, as I, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, the, the Europeans are in some ways, I would, I would argue, quite formal in, in what they require. And uh, it's, it, the commission and the data protection authorities have said repeatedly that this is really important to them. So again, you, you'll need to designate somebody who has to take responsibility for data protection compliance. I mean, I think in, in many cases that'll be you know, who, uh, that'll probably be maybe your general counsel or, or uh, somebody generally involved with uh, regulatory compliance. Um, it does need to be somebody um, who, that, you, that you can make a logical case for in case a data protection authority asks about it. Um, and again, um, you're, you're not expected to create a, a new headcount uh, in order to do that. Um, even now, for, even for, for, for some of the larger companies, for example, uh, some larger companies have what are called chief privacy officers. Um, those officers often fill the uh, data protection officer role. Um, if, you know, if, if you uh, collect data in the, in the European Union, um, you transfer that data overseas, for example, to the United States, um, you need to just be aware of under what legal basis you're doing that. And there are three principal ways that you can do that if you do that from the EU to um, the United States. You can become a member of the EU-US Privacy Shield. You can um, have binding corporate rules which have to be accepted by um, data protection authorities. BCRs are generally for larger companies, and there's no, I, don't, I don't think there's even 100 companies that have them, um, and they're, they're for um, corporations. Um, and then you can also, uh, they're, uh, sorry, let me rephrase that. They are for, they're generally for um, companies that transfer the data, um, but keep that data within their corporate structure when they transfer the data to the United States, but it's just that the data is actually physically being processed in the United States. Model contracts are contracts between different companies, and again, they're approved by data protection authorities. As a practical matter um, um, for SMEs, but even large companies, um, the EU-US Privacy Shield is turning out to be I would say the principal way in which um, personal data is being uh, transferred from the EU to uh, the United States. Um, there are now, I think, 2,500 companies that are uh, using the Privacy Shield. Um, the United States and the European Union 
um, had their first review of the Privacy Shield here in Washington, D.C., um, uh, September 18 to 19. Um, that seems to have gone well. The, the commission is now going to be producing a report on the shield, which will go, uh, which will go to the parliament and to the council. The council are the governments in, in the European Union. Um, we expect that that will be largely a positive um, uh, review or, or, or document, but I'm sure that there will be recommendations for changes. Uh, but hopefully not major ones. So um, for those of you who are thinking, oh my God, this is happening in May next year, and um, what am I going to do, and I don't want to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on a blue chip law firm to get me in compliance, I need some place to start. Um, in addition to the uh, British ICO uh, materials that I mentioned earlier. Um, I, I think that the Bavarian Data Protection Authority um, has come out with a pretty good two-page document, which is a questionnaire for companies um, on general data protection regulation implementation. And I think if you open that, open the link to there and, and actually read the, the questions, uh, I think I think you'll find that um, it's not as scary as, as some of you uh, might think. And by the way, um, why am I, why the Bavarian Data Protection Authority? That has to do with Germany's federal structure, so they have a national data protection authority, but each of their lender or their states has their own data protection authority as well. So, uh, so that's why you have that. So anyway, the the questions. Um, that the Bavarian DPA um, asks have to do with, you know, the structure and responsibility in the company for, for data, uh, records for processing activities, what's the involvement of third parties, uh, what kind of transparency and assurance of, of data subjects rights you have, some questions on accountability and risk management, and also, what have you done to uh, comply with the data breach requirements? And you know, my view is that um, if, if, if you're able to tell a good story on what you've done based on you know, either this questionnaire or the 12 steps that the British ICO came out with, um, you, know, you should be in fairly good shape. Um, So there's some more information uh, that's sort of summarized on this slide as to what the Bavarian Data Protection Authority is asking. They actually already sent out this questionnaire to 50 companies. Um, I don't know what answers they got, but, um, and those companies were not obliged to answer the question, but, um, but I think they, they got a fairly good response. So, um, you know, in, a, in addition to um, you know, being familiar with um, what's actually in the text of the General Data Protection Regulation and taking a look at some of the, the, guy, the resources that I've pointed you to, um, it's also important to at least know that the Data Protection Authorities work on guidance for how to implement the um, uh, General Data Protection Regulation, and they've already issued guidance on data portability, data protection officers, the lead supervisory authority, in other words, who is supposed to be, data processing at work, um, data protection impact assessments. And they plan to release guidance later on this year on pri profiling and automated decision making. And by the end of the year, there's supposed to be guidelines on consent, transparency, and breach notification. So um, there are links to the guidance that's, that's already out there. Um, uh, you know, um, I, if, 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 if one of these issues is of particular interest to your company, it, it's definitely worthwhile taking a look at, at the guidance. And generally, I mean, my experience has been that if you ask a data protection authority questions, they'll, they'll generally get back to you, although it, it might take uh, quite a bit of time. Um, Data portability, just to, to let you know, um, uh, that is, a, as I mentioned earlier, quite a big issue. 
um, we, we did um, submit comments um, to the Article 29 Working Party on that, on that topic. Um, I, I think our, we, had, we made a number of arguments, but I, I think the, probably the biggest one is, is that companies should not be obliged to have to produce um, application programming interfaces in, in every case. Um, so here's a sort of, let's see, so I spent 30 minutes, um, um, we'll have, a, have 25 minutes for Q&A. Um, so I tried to sort of summarize um, what, uh, in, in this slide, what you should do as a company. You should determine whether you're subject to the general data protection regulation. You, you probably are if you have some kind of activity in Europe that involves collecting uh, data. Um, you should decide whether to appoint a data protection officer. You probably should. Again, you probably don't have to create a new headcount to do this, but whoever you appoint has to be somebody who can logically fill the role. The role. I think you should make sure your consent language is easily understandable. You should review contracts with processors, i.e. with third-party companies. Determine Again, this has to do with sort of doing an inventory as, as to what kind of uh, data, personal data you collect. Um, determine whether you handle particularly sensitive data. If you do, you might have to do a data protection impact assessment for new operations. What is sensitive data? The, 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 the Europeans um, most often uh, say is it's data that involves processing that could have a legal effect on a data subject. So, you know, credit scoring, as I said, is, is one example. Uh, um, something that may or may not make it easier or harder to get a driver's license could be another example. Um, make sure you can explain to a data protection authority how you can fulfill data subject rights. Um, you've got to be able to tell a good story. Um, determine what mechanism to use if you transfer personally identifiable information outside the European Union. So, um, we, I've spoken for 37 minutes, I think. Um, I'm happy to do questions. Um, so, uh, Matt, I guess I should be uh, reading what's on the left part of my screen for questions, right? Yeah, just as a reminder to our audience, uh, you can submit questions via the chat tab in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Please type your question in. You can direct that to, to all, or you can send that to either Carl or myself. And Carl, I'll just read out the first question here. Uh, if you are based in the U.S. and collecting data from all registered visitors, including EU people, does that constitute transferring data to the U.S.? Um, if, if you are collecting the data from an EU national and you're collecting the data, because it says you're registered visit, oh, I guess a registered visitor to your website, um, if it's a visitor to a website and the EU national is in the European Union when she or he provides the data, then yes, you are uh, collecting uh, data um, from those visitors and you are subject to the general data protection regulation. Um, and then the, the second part of the question is if you're, are you then transferring data to the United States. It depends on where you're actually doing the processing. And there are a lot of companies that, I mean, if you're doing, cloud, if you have a cloud computing contract, it, it depends, you know, where that cloud computing company is actually processing the data. Many have data centers in, in the European Union. Um, some, some do it in the United States. So it would, it would, it would depend on, it would, it would be a case by case basis. Are you going to read the next questions as they come in, Matt? Sure. So our next question is, who do we make the breach notification to? So um, as, 
as I as I mentioned, uh, you, you should make the um, breach notification to the data protection authority that you report to, uh, and and um, uh, you, you're supposed to you're supposed to be able to have a, a a a primary data protection authority that you report to, even if you are operating in all uh, 27 uh, member states. Um, but I mean, it would have to be you know something logical. So, for example, if you do business in all 27 member states, but half of your business is in Germany. Um, and the rest is spread around all over Europe, um, I, I would probably um, notify the German Data Protection Authority. And again, you need to um, take a look at Article 34. In some cases, you actually need to notify individuals whose data has been hacked or breached, um, but you need to take a look at the circumstances under which you have to do that. And you're supposed to do that um, without quote unquote undue delay, I haven't seen a good definition of that, so I, I, I need to do some more research on that. But I, I honestly don't know what undue delay means in this context. All right, good. Carl, our next question has to do with collecting necessary consent. In light of the Honda Fine under e privacy directive, how should U.S. companies that don't have legit GDPR defined consents collect the necessary consent? Um, sorry, can you can you um, can you can you repeat the question? I don't think I caught the whole thing. Sure. In light of the Honda Fine under e privacy directive, mm -hmm. how should U.S. companies that don't have legit GDPR defined consents collect necessary consent. I'm not. I, I'm not sure how to answer that question. I'm going to have to get back to that person who asked it. Okay. We have a few more questions queuing up here. Carl, how does GDPR affect sending marketing emails from the U.S. to Europe? So uh, you can do that. Um, the, uh, um, you, you may have to get consent uh, to do that. Um, the easiest way to take a look at um, what you might have to do is to, uh, if you click on the link for, I think it's the British ICO um, SME Toolkit, there is a, a link which leads you to uh, like questions that you have to answer if you want to do direct marketing. Take a look at that, and that should answer uh, your questions for for what you have to for what you need to uh, do. And um, for the person or persons who are interested in that, if you can't find the right link, because I know you can't open the links now, uh, after I after you've had a chance to take a look at the slides, and if you still can't find the right information, let me know, and I'll, 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 I'll point you to where you need to go. Okay, good. Carl, our next question builds on that, and you gave some people some destinations where they can go to find out some more specifics. But the question is, do the basics like name, address, and email, and job title qualify as data? Yes. Uh, and I think the question is, do they qualify as personal data? And they do. Okay. Because remember, about actual. But remember, what's covered here is personal data, not uh, you know data collected by jet engines, for example. It's data that can be that can be linked to a physical person. And. Second part of that question, would that also include behavior? So specifically, does tracking what web pages they read or what white papers they download, does that equal data? Yes. Okay, good. Next question uh, comes from one of our smaller members. We're a small publishing company. We may have EU people find us online and sign up to receive email or purchase a subscription from us. 
Does any of this apply to us? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, if, you're, if somebody visits your website and they, they sign up to receive your information, or to, 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 to receive your publication, and you collect you know, their name and email address and presumably credit card information, even though that gets deleted usually typically after each use, um, then yes, you, you are actually covered by the general data protection regulation. But you know, I also think that, um, that you know, with, without sort of minimizing uh, the importance of this, um, you know, I think companies need to look at you know what percentage of their business is is done in Europe. How sensitive is the information that they're that they are collecting, and and sort of uh, know that. Um, and you know, if 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 it's sort of an incidental part of your company's activity, you know, I, I think doing some of the basic things that I outlined in in this presentation. Um, will will uh, will be fine for you. You wouldn't necessarily have to, you know, put in place a huge infrastructure to deal with this personally identifiable information, like other companies um, will have to do. Okay, very good, Carl. The next question deals with any distinctions between different parties who actually handle the data. The question is, are there any gray areas you've experienced around the distinction between processor and controller? For example, has there ever been a case where the controller has all the interface with the users, but some data passes to the processor? Yeah, there is, there is uh, a lot of gray in this, and there was a lot of discussion um, when the general data protection regulation was put into place. Um, the... Um, Generally, the controller has the responsibility, but you know, in order to understand um, this and, and everybody's obligations, you have to take a look at Chapter 4 of the General Data Protection Regulation, which deals with controller and processor responsibilities. There's a section on general obligations. There's a section on security of personal data. There's a section on data protection impact assessment and prior consultation the DPO, codes of conduct, certification. It's a very tricky, frankly, a very, very tricky area. Um, and, and uh, you know, you, 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 if that's an issue for your, for your company, you really need to review Chapter 4 quite carefully. Okay, good. Carl, I know you've talked about uh, definitions and potential scenarios of violations here. We have a general question on what constitutes a breach. Can you offer some more specifics on that? Um, well, uh, I mean, I guess a breach would be a hack. Somebody um, or some organization or individuals who gain access to personally identifiable inf information I mean, we've had a major one involving a major company here in the United States recently. I'm thinking of examples uh, like that. Okay, good. Again, um, I, I would, uh, you know, there's language on this. Um, so articles, uh, Article 33 is the best thing to, I don't have it right in front of me, so I can't read it for, uh, to you. Um, because of the way my computer is set up, otherwise I would. But I, w I would go to Article 33, um, which uh, talks about this. Good. We're I, starting to get a lot of. Actually, I'm sorry, go ahead, Carl. The whole of Section 2 and Chapter 4, so Article 32 to 34. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, good. We're starting to get a lot of very specific uh, scenario questions and just encourage our audience to seek out some of the resources that Carl has mentioned. Uh, but the question is, if we have a user request to receive our newsletters from someone in the EU uh, and that data goes directly into our email service provider to add them to the list, do we need to have an automated process that determines if they are in the EU to present an additional form 
and what do we need to do about the data transfer to our mail provider? Uh, do you need to have an automated process? Um, I would think it would actually be fairly easy to have an automated process to to determine. I guess not not by the by the email address because people have Gmail addresses and they live, you know, in on all six continents of the world. But you know, maybe if you ask for a person's physical address as well as email address and telephone number, that way you can identify where they're where they're physically located, and um, and and that way you know determine you know whose personal data um, you're you're dealing with. Um, but you know, again, I, I, you know, without, you know, th I mean, this is this is slightly risky for me to say because I'm 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 here to I'm really here to provide policy advice, but but here I'm 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 actually providing somewhat legal advice to to uh, to companies, but I'm not the senior director for for legal advice. I'm the senior director for public policy, um, but you know, m my sense is. Is if you're a company and you're sort of collecting incidental personal data having to do with, um, you know, some of your customers who subscribe to your publications, um, you definitely need to know um, if they are, um, you know, EU citizens, and you probably should have somebody who can fill the data protection officer role, um, but. You're also not a company that a data protection authority is going to be looking at first in terms of, um, you know, inspections for, you know, whether you've complied or not complied with the data protection regulations. So I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, minimize the importance of this because it, it is important and it is something that a lot of companies rightfully need to spend quite a bit of compliance resources on, but. You know, I think the, the level of expense and effort depends on the size of the company and the size of the ex exposure to the European market. Good. Carl, we have another question uh, about the distinction between processor and controller. And the question is, can the processor ever have controller liability? That's another one I'll have, to, I'll have to get back to the questioner about. I, I think the answer, okay. I just, that's a, it's a really tricky legal question. Can the processor ever have controller liability? Um, I, you know, um, what I, here's how I would answer that question, and I, I need to dig up the, the right article to that. I, I, I can't I, – the processors, just like controllers, have certain responsibilities to uh, protect uh, the data. So, um, for example, if there's a data breach into the processors, uh, uh, you know, into data held by a processor, then that processor needs to do the needful to um, to, to notify um, for for that particular e event. However, if 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 it's a question of, for example, the data portability requirement, it's the controller who has the obligation to uh, make the data uh, portable for the consumer. So it really depends. On what right you're you're talking about, and what responsibility you're talking about. I'm sorry that I'm answering this question in a fairly complicated way, but it's a it's it's a it's a complicated question. So I I'd, I'd say processors are not uh, don't have the same liability as the controllers, but processors have many responsibilities under this regulation that they need to comply with as well. 
Folks, we have a couple more questions queued up here, and we have a few minutes left. So if you do have questions for Carl, I would encourage you to submit them via the Q&A tab in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Carl, we have a couple more scenarios, if you can answer them. Uh, the next question is, we could come into possession of, quote, identifier information through various means, such as email footers, business cards, online articles like blogs, etc. In such cases, should we contact such individuals or companies and inform them that we have such data. If you're planning to process the data in some form or fashion, uh, probably, probably yes. Um, that's, that's how I would answer that question. Okay. Next question. What about existing data that doesn't have a clear pathway of consent? Do we have to delete it? Um, you need to take a look at uh, what um, the grounds are for what are called uh, legitimate uh, processing of data. Um, and there are some ways that you can process data without having uh, consent. Um, but if you do do that processing, um, the actual um, the data subject, you always have to remember, has certain rights. So he or she could come to you and say, hey, you're processing my data. Um, I'd like to have it erased. So um, again, a complicated answer to a complicated question. Okay, good. And Carl, our final question uh, seems to be both a question and also a statement for the group. Carl said, the size of the company and how much Euro activity might influence how much attention you pay. But since all websites are usable in the EU, everyone picks up some web registrants. So with such huge fines, mustn't you make this at least a reasonable priority? Uh, yes. Um, again, I, I, I don't want to minimize uh, the importance of the general data protection regulation. You know, even for companies that don't have an office in the European Union, if you do, um, if you collect um, personal information of EU citizens in the European Union, even if you don't charge for the service you provide, you are subject uh, to the general data protection regulation. So you do need to make this a reasonable priority. And what, what I mean, what that means, I think, is that. A company um, needs to designate a person to have the data protection authority officer role. He or she should at a minimum go through the 12 step, steps or recommendations that the British Information Commission office has, know what kind of data is, is uh, being collected, and, and uh, you know, figure out um, what figure out um, what should be done with it. Um, it, it, it you, but you know, reasonable is, it can vary between, do you have a compliance team of half a dozen people working on this, and you're retain, retaining a blue chip law firm for several hundred thousand dollars a year, to you know, having one person designated to do this function, and it's 30% you know, uh, of her or his time. It, it really does depend on on, on you know, the size of your exposure. Um, and uh, you know, the important thing, I think, is for a company to actually know what it's collecting, and if it receives questions, to be able to tell a good story. And again, if, if you actually take a look at what the ICO recommends, Take a look at the two-page questionnaire per, um, sent out by the Bavarian Data Protection Authority, and you're able to tell a good story. Um, I think um, you'll be um, you'll be in good stead. All right, terrific. Carl, your contact information is on the main slide on the webinar right now. If our members have additional questions or follow-up, can they reach out to you? And is there anyone else at SIA uh, they should keep in mind as well? Um, 
certainly they can reach out to me. They can reach out to my colleague, uh, Diane Pinto. Um, we, can, we can make her email address available and my colleague, uh, David LeDuc, and we can make his email address available as, as well. All right, terrific. Carl, great job setting some light on a very big and difficult topic. Folks, thank you for joining us today. As I mentioned, we will be distributing an archive and the slides for this webcast soon. Thanks again for joining us today. This concludes the webcast. Thank you.